So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's Focal Plane Features webinar. If this is the first time you hear about Focal Plane, this is a community site hosted by Journal of Cell Science, where you can find resources, blog posts, and all sorts of information around microscopy. So do check it out, or even better, register and become a contributor. Um, today, we are delighted to have three excellent speakers who will talk about different projects and tools related to data analysis for volume EM. We'll have time for some questions and after each talk. So um, please drop your questions at any time in the Q&A box. After the session, you also have the opportunity to meet and further discuss with the speakers in Remo. Our first speaker is Anna Kresh, group leader at EMBL Heidelberg, and she's probably best known for developing Elastic with her team, which is an easy to use interactive tool that leverages machine learning to segment, classify, track, and count cells. But today she'll focus on something else and talk about whole organism segmentation. So Anna, please take it away. Okay. Thank you very much for the for inviting me and for the kind introduction. Yeah, indeed, today I'm actually going to talk about the science part of my group. So we have two parts, which are, of course, very intermingled, where one develops Elastic and the other one does actual research in computer vision. And let me try to share my slides again. Uh -huh. Yeah, so don't be scared. First, it will look like, you know, the same screen repeating very many times, but then I'll switch to the actual presentation. Okay. Do you see that? Yeah, I, looks good. Yeah, looks okay. good. And then we can hear you. Yeah, then I'll just go on and then you tell me if I suddenly disappear. So I want to tell you today about the volume EM segmentation work that we've been doing in my lab. And we are in general interested in the question of um, yeah, boundary based segmentation, which arises not only in volume EM, but also in other modalities. But today, yeah, let's talk about EM. And the first project I want to tell you about is this. Um, is the one where we segmented like this whole beautiful worm called Platinaris, Platinaris dumeridi. It was a very big collaborative project with many labs and uh, driven by the biological vision of that aren't. And well, yeah, so the way it worked was like that. So the, the whole idea there was to create an atlas where we would have both the volume EM data and the gene expression that we can have from the whole mount fish. And then, so you see, we can have the expression of the different genes that you then image in the different individual worms, right? And besides those, you also have the whole animal as one thing image in EM. And the reason why you can actually overlay all of them on top of each other is that at this developmental stage, the animal is extremely stereotypic and you can really just combine them by registration, right? So in the end, what you wanted to arrive to and well have arrived to is the image that you see in the center where you have the, um, yeah, so you have the EM volume where all the cells are segmented, and then you also know the gene expression in every cell. Right, and so that's what the EM volume looks like in more detail. Right, it's uh, this worm called Platinaris dumeridi, six days post fertilization, imaged with the SBFSAM microscope at the resolution of 10 by 10 by 20 nanometers. So the actual signal part of the volume is about 1.5 terabytes. Right, and so we first tried with the segmentation baseline that was developed for Connectomics um, yeah, quite a while ago. And um, yeah, so there, this is like a two-step pipeline where you start from a boundary prediction. And uh, so you predict the cell membranes. And then out of these boundary predictions, you then make super pixels, which are like this, um, yeah, uh, pixels, which you know belong together. You connect into super pixels. And then on top of the super pixels, you then make it like a graph-based agglomeration problem. And you actually agglomerate the super pixels into a full segmentation. And the reason why we want to do it in two steps is that while well, the boundary prediction, because EM data is difficult, boundary prediction is not going to be perfect. And we have to somehow take it into account. So if you look at the boundary prediction for this data set in more detail, you will see where these purple arrows are, are pointing to that, yeah, you know, like in this area, for example, where the muscle is bordering some other cell, it doesn't really look like a boundary, it doesn't predict it. Also at the, where you have the KVT forming, hasn't seen that, also doesn't think it's a boundary. There are also just ruptures in these boundary predictions. But if you then make a super pixelization step, you can see that as the borders of the super pixels, these boundaries are present. So again, even though the boundary prediction didn't put them where they should have been, you now have a chance to actually recover the objects in, in their completeness. So if you follow this uh, uh, approach, you can actually get a full segmentation that doesn't look too bad, even up close. But if you look really closely, you will see that there are still some things to fix. So particularly, we know that 
it works well in the areas where the imaging itself has run well, right? So where the sample preparation was good, where everything was just, it looks nice. But also what is perhaps an even much bigger limitation, it works well in the areas which look similar to the training data that was used to predict the boundaries. Right? And the problems arise in, for example, places like this, where you have areas of the membrane perhaps missing, maybe it should not be there, I don't know, right? I would have to look in 3D, but sometimes you just have them missing because of sample preparation issues. Or in areas like this, where you see this very thick boundaries between the muscle cells or muscle cells and other parts, and these were just not present in the data that we used to train the neural network that predicted the cell membranes, because most of that data was actually taken around the head and uh, was yeah, separating the uh, neuron bodies. So yeah, then we started thinking, well, what else can we do? Because the usual answer from the natural image world in this case would be to just take more training data, because if it hasn't seen it, it's hard to recognize. But we've already spent months there with just the training data because doing it in 3D by hand is very time consuming, also not really the most fun thing you can do. So we started thinking, what can we do to actually improve this segmentation without acquiring any new training data? And this is how we came to the idea of introducing top-down priors. And to understand what that does is like, yeah, so imagine that the neural network is now fixed and uh, let's see what actually happens at this graph-based agglomeration step. Right. So in more detail, what happens there is that you have your super pixels and now you want to decide which super pixels you merge and which ones you keep separated. Right. And then the, uh, you make a graph out of the super pixels and the edges of the graphs are weighted by the strength of the boundary between them. And this allows you to actually solve this graph partitioning problem without having seeds. So it's not like watershed and you can have the edges that really want to merge and edges that really want to stay on. Like here, you can see the positive edges that really want to stay on. There is a strong boundary and the negative edges that actually want to get merged. And this uh, overall problem can be solved by the multicat algorithm to global optimality. Right? So this is what we always use for graph agglomeration. And like to put in the top down priors, what we were thinking of is like, imagine that you have this super pixels now and somehow from some Oracle, you get the information that these two areas in the image must be separated, right? So that means that you can put an edge between these two super pixels as well and actually give it a pretty large weight and then say, okay, this should really never come together. So compared to the regular multicut formulation, you can then see that what we do differently or what we do in addition is that we add these additional edges that then can express the domain knowledge that we have that some parts of the image should just never belong together or that some parts of the image must belong together. So in practice, what does it look like? So if you have super pixels, which look like this, right? but then you, it's not the only thing that you have because this is an EM image. So you don't need to image anything else. It already has everything. And it turns out that nuclei in these images are actually fairly easy to segment. So this chromatin texture is so different that um, yeah, so nuclei are not a problem. Then we segmented the nuclei and then we said, okay, now let's have these repulsions around the nuclei because we know that at this developmental stage, also in most areas of the organism, every cell only has one nucleus. So then you take a nucleus and then you put this kind of repulsive pushing away edges from this nucleus to everywhere else. And now, even if not like in the case that I'm showing here, but in the other cases where you have weak boundaries, where a boundary just disappears for some reason, Still, if you have the two nuclei, they will try to push each other off. And uh, somewhere it will find where to cut the two cells and you will not have a false merge in this case. Right? And conversely, one can do go the other way and say that even if something in the nucleus makes it think that it should be cut in half, it actually shouldn't. So if you have an, two parts of the same nucleus, then the super pixels that they belong to should actually belong to the same cell. Another thing that you can put in is tissue boundaries. So like here, you can see this catastrophic merge that happened because somewhere it didn't recognize the tissue boundary. But luckily tissue boundaries are actually easy to segment with elastic, which is yeah, the tool that my lab develops, as you have heard. And uh, there you can take a very down sample version of the volume. And if you do that, the difference between, for example, epithelial tissue and the rest is becoming very apparent or the difference between lipid droplets and this glands and other things. So you can have approximate tissue boundaries and then you can actually enforce them on the graph as well and say, if you have two super pixels, which belong to clearly different tissues, then they also should not be together. And it seems like fairly trivial thing, but you see that it still, without that, it still makes this really horrible errors. 
because when you have these glands, right, it only has one nucleus somewhere, these areas don't have nuclei, and then they just get merged all together. And if you enforce the tissue boundaries, you actually get it out very nicely. And with this kind of a combined bottom-up and top-down approach, we actually arrived at the full segmentation of the approximately 11,500 cells, as we now know, right? and also all of their nuclei and the chromatin substructures in the nuclei. Right? And uh, what we were especially like happy to see is that there is such an enormous variability of the cells when you look at the whole organism. Right? So you have muscles that really go all the way through. It's the muscles that I guess it uses to swim. So they're like very long, but uh, yeah, very nice to look at, very different from everything else. You also have this, yeah, as another example, these weird cells called nephridia, which have cilia that they extend to each other. And also epithelial cells, which also look kind of, yeah, all intertwined together. And all of these can be segmented and we can now actually enjoy looking at them and thinking about their morphology. And because it's a one big atlas, we can now not only look at their morphology, but also overlay the gene expression on top and then analyze what this could mean. And uh, to do that, you can look at this uh, PG plugin called Mobi that Christian Tischer at Amble has developed. And this is really like a tool to visualize the multimodal data. And there you can really combine then the uh, raw EM volumes and their segmentations and the gene expression data that comes on top. Right, so this was mostly using these repulsive forces. So can we also use the attractive forces? Yes. And for that, I wanted to show you another project also with that Lefarence lab that just got published like two days ago. So we we're all very excited about it. And in this project, we were looking at sponges. And uh, so Detlef and Jake, the main authors of the paper, had this, they yeah, wanted to study the different cell types in sponges. And so here is an example of a sponge gonocyte chamber imaged with FIPSEM. And you can see there is this cell in the middle, and they are all kind of stretching their tentacles to it. And what we wanted to do here is to segment that and to see how close, how exactly how close they come and yeah, what does it look like there in the middle? So for that, since we didn't have any ground truth at all, and because of all of these empty areas, the problem didn't look that difficult. We decided we'll just go with elastic and we segmented it with the elastic out of context workflow. So here you don't need any dense training data, you just yeah, label and it interactively learns it. And uh, yeah, so this is the boundaries that we have arrived to. The problem here was that afterwards, when we constructed the graph, all these microvilli and flagella were so thin that they were very often broken up. So I can maybe show you. So here is the raw data. And um, yeah, in here you see the super pixels. And you see that these like long tentacle-like structures, they are really cut like a sausage. And to connect them again, because the boundary area between them is so small, um, the evidence there is also not so high. So there, what we decided to do was to actually go for the attractive potentials to avoid them being cut up so much. And um, we have done a semantic segmentation. So we predicted for all these pixels, if they belong to this flagella or microvilli, the, which extend, or to the cell body or to the nucleus or to their boundary. And then we said, okay, then if we have super pixels, which belong to the class of flagella or microvilli, then, and their neighbors do as well, then between neighbors that both belong to these extension classes, we actually say the boundary is not that strong, right? So we put an attractive potential between them. And there you can then make a segmentation, which looks like this. And uh, yeah, if you correct it a little bit more, you will even have the whole chamber, right? And now you can really see that this in beautiful video that Julia Mison from the EM facility has done, that you can see that this purple cell, the neuroid cell, as they call it, um, that is right in the middle. And the others are kind of, yeah, putting their microvilli and flagella to it. And you can see just how close they come and how it really looks like they are, well, I don't want to say communicating, but they would be close enough to be communicating. Let's put it this way. And that's why we actually wanted to do a segmentation in there so that we could see if they do come close enough. Yeah, and then for that, you, of course, also need them uninterrupted. Okay, so now you actually have a segmentation. What can we do with the segmented cells? And here we will go back quickly to the Platinaris project. And uh, over there, we are now working. So this is not published work. Um, we are working on trying to find a representation for the morphology of the cells that would bring cells of the same type close in this representation space. And when I say the same type, it's, I don't mean the very narrow genetic definition of type, but some, 
yeah, so type in a very general way. So what we mean by this is more like if you look at the cells here, you see that they are all different. How can we express that they are different in a way that would not be extremely prescriptive like you would if you had explicit features? Right? So of course, you can describe everything if you just say, well, let's look at the surface, at the volume, at the radii. But we wanted to have a learned description that would, as the only thing, just really try to group the ones of the same type together. Right? And the approach that we took, so like uh, skipping many steps, uh, this is done together with Virginia Ullman, and uh, where they are looking for good representations of shape. And so in here, we have like a normal um, autoencoder to which we put in the masks of segmented cells and also their meshes. And then out of those, we actually extract from the bottleneck layer, we extract the representation. Right, so there are some issues in there, such as the variability of sizes, because they are all different. And sometimes, sometimes you have these giant muscles, and sometimes you have fairly compact neuron cells. Right, so yeah, we worked on like having a texture descriptor that would actually sample this texture in a representative way throughout the cells of different sizes. And yeah, we also have a shape descriptor separately, and then we just stack them together. Right, and with that, we have actually labeled a few cells, which was not used in the learning, but only used for validation afterwards. And we see that with this kind of um, uh, approach, we can reach a 96% accuracy in predicting cell types. And you can see what types we had in there. So some ciliated, dark neurons, muscles, normal neurons, gut cells, epithelial cells, secretory cells, and some other kind of secretory cells. Yeah, so that actually works pretty well, but the manually labeled data set is pretty small. Right, so then we looked at the whole animal predictions, which actually makes me even more optimistic about it, because you can see that, um, for example, epithelial cell predictions are exactly where you would expect them to be. And what is also very nice is that you see a lot of epithelial cells here in the mouth and like the, the digestive tract, which are also epithelial, but, um, but a little bit different from the ones that are on the skin and also not used in, our, in the training when we were doing this evaluation. Right. And then if you look at the neurons, they are also where you would expect the neurons to be. Right. And the muscles are also exactly how you would think they should be. Right. So you have the muscles that are like orthogonal to each other. Yeah. You have the ciliated cells where the ciliated cells belong. And uh, the kind of analysis that you can do with it, well, you can just yeah, enjoy looking at the cells that you know about. Or you can also try to find similar cells. So for example, you can say, this is my cell of interest. What are the nearest neighbors? You have to remember it's a one and a half terabyte volume. So doing it purely by visual inspection, so remembering some cell and then searching through the whole thing, through the 11 and a half thousand cells just to find it again or find something similar again is actually quite tedious. So that's why we can now automate this kind of analysis. And um, you can say, okay, find me cells which are similar to this one. And that's the kind of cells that it will come up with. And as you can see, they are indeed pretty similar. Um, yeah, or here is another example of ciliated cells, which also, like, if you give it the left one and ask, like, find me similar cells, these are all also clearly similar and of the same type. Yeah, so what we are looking into now is trying to explore the cells that are kind of in between these clear types, because we labeled the seven types that um, were very easy to define. But then you have these things like neurons in the gut or the neurosecretory cells. And uh, we now want to see how we can find this kind of, um, yeah, how the cell type changes as you go through different cells. Okay, with that, I'm actually rolling close to the end. And I wanted to show you the group that does it all. And to say that, yeah, I'm still hiring. We still have plenty of space. This is our uh, last year's socially distant group retreat. And um, yeah, so here, I think the main thing I wanted to summarize is just that, you know, segmentation in EM, we are getting there. So if you have volume EM data, it's not like we can routinely do that and give you the tools and you'll be able to do terabytes yourselves. But we are so much further ahead than we were, say, five years ago, that I think also the day when anyone will be able to do this is also not far. And for us, it's, of course, a great pleasure to look at the very interesting data like this and at the cool biology that our collaborators are doing. Thank you. OK, let me. Stop sharing so that you yeah don't see yeah. yourself multiplied so many times. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. That was great. Um, questions from Jan Funke. So maybe Jan, if I can ask you to um, come on stage and ask them yourself, that's easier. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. So first question is um, about these these constraints that you introduced in the first half of the talk. Um, I was just wondering. Um, like how scalable this whole um, approach would be. Like imagine you had a really huge data set, right, uh, of the 
of a size where the region adjacency graph would not even fit into memory any longer, right? Um, does it does it still work? Does do you have like um, uh, a method that propagates those constraints? I mean, this is a pretty big problem. Uh, yes, as, as they happen. <laughs> so it's uh, I mean it is block wise. I I don't think we have a mechanism to propagate the constraints because our constraints are still fairly local, right? So the constraint that the cell should not have two nuclei does not propagate to the other block. I do mm. not read with this. Uh, the cell tissue boundaries are also kind of localized. So I guess if you just wanted to make sure, can you think of a very non-local constraint? Maybe that would be easier to see. Like well, yes, a, a do not uh, merge constraint, for instance. Right. So I really like the one with the um, where you have the nuclear segmentation. Right. So this is something that the connectomics community is talking about since at least a decade. Right. That we should have all these high-level priors. Right. If we find all the nuclei, we know that every neuron has only one of them. Right. So, so these are great constraints, but I think you know the, the point where they matter the most is somewhere deeply embedded in the neural yeah. that distal branches are starting to touch, right? And this can oh, be I potentially very mean, far yes. away. Mm -hmm. right? Think, think yeah, about so a mouse brain, right? So in, in, in 20 years, we probably have a mouse brain image, then, then we would like to use your method, right? Would it work? What do we need to do to make it work on a mouse brain? Yeah, I guess you could propagate them also, right? Because um, you know the way how it works now is blockwise. Right? And when you so you solve it blockwise, but then you you still when you're merging the blocks, right? You are solving the uh, the interface problem, right? But the main things which are already merged are also still present. So in principle, you could just elevate them, right? And you can yeah. then treat the merged objects inside the blocks as your new super pixels in a way, and then still say that yes, I mean this should still be separated. It's just that. Of course, you know, the price of doing it wrong somewhere in the beginning then acts as a repulsion everywhere later and could lead to interesting errors. But uh, mm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, we didn't have any, like, because no, actually, for, for muscles, we probably did. But muscles have a small nucleus, right? And then you have like the big thing coming off it. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we should have tried this. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, All right, and then the, the second question is just more like a curiosity question. You, you mentioned these um, these texture descriptors that you are learning um, for the cell type classification. Are they trained in a supervised manner, knowing what kind of cell types you put into? No, no, completely unsupervised. This is like a SimCLR kind of technique? Um, well, it's contrastive, right? But it's not, uh, I mean, we have the cell segmentations, right? So yeah. we don't have to do like, um, you know, image level stuff. Uh, but yeah, so basically it's an autoencoder and it has a normal reconstruction loss. Yeah. Uh, for the texture cubes, and then it Got has it. an additional loss that is basically just pushing different cells away from each other. Got it. So Got it. Cool. In, in a way, yes, but uh, really mm. in a way. Yeah, yeah. Good. Thanks. Sure. We also have a question from Eric, so I'll now add, her, add uh, Eric to the stage so he can ask it himself. You can turn on your um, camera and mic. Hi, Anna. Can you understand me? Yes. Okay, um, I have a question concerning the cell type classification as well. Normally, I would expect the latent space which you used in the classification to be organized uh, or well defined only if you use the latent space in the upsampling, like a style type of approach, or if you use a variational outer encoder. Have you used something for regularization there, or was it just a plain outer encoder? Because no, normally... that's a plain outer encoder. So we tried with variational, it was not better. Right. So it's like okay. it's not worse, it's not better, it's just like it doesn't make any difference. I think it's well organized just because the cells really are so different. Right. So if you look at um, you know, as a human, you have just by shape already no problem to distinguish very many types. Right. So I think it's uh oh, there is a clear connection between the type so, and so the function, you... right? And then the function and the morphology. So I don't think it's if I think if the morphology descriptor is good. It's not that surprising that they are actually nicely clustered, right? You, you don't have that many completely in between cell types. So you know what happens like if we look more in the neighborhood, right? So this is really just individual cells. If we try to mix in the neighbors to see like also how they would influence it, then you really get the UMAPs like you're talking about, right? It's not so clustered because then they kind of stream into each other. And there you can then see more like as you move along this UMAP, you can see that, okay, this is that organ, and then it kind of yeah, transfers into this and then into that. Yeah, but if you just look at individual cells, they're just different. Okay, so it's because the cell types are so different that you can get the sweet clusters, because normally yeah. I, I would need something like a style in the upsampling or, as I said, the variational autoencoder to distinguish these. Well, there okay, is a bottleneck, right? So it's, uh, it's not like an infinite number of features, but yeah, I think that 
some of these clusters are really just that different, yes. Okay. I think we have to soon move on. Just a very quick, um, short question from Nadine um, Randell. She's asking, how would your method work on anisotropic data? Would you expect more challenges compared to isotropic volumes? You mean for segmentation? It works for anisotropic data. I mean, we tried it. It's fine. Yeah. It's just that you know, luckily this data was all isotropic, but we have used it on anisotropic data. Uh, for the cell type descriptions, I, we'd have to think, right? We already do it on a pretty down sample data, but I would think that to really keep it uh, good, we would probably have to down sample to make it isotropic. Yeah, because you don't want the cell type to be different depending on what orientation it is in the volume. And it will probably be a lot more like on anisotropic data, if it's not very well aligned, you also don't want like the cell shape features to be distracted by the alignment artifacts. So this is also kind of something to watch out for. Okay, thank you. I'm second speaker who is uh, Mark Muller. Um, Dagmar, if you can turn on your um, camera. So um, Dagmar leads a research group focusing on biomedical uh, Max Dadbrook Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin. And the title of her talk today is Matching Drosophila Neuronal Morphologies Across Imaging Modalities. Um, Thanks. Can you see my slides? Yeah, I can see them and I can hear. Okay, perfect. All right, thanks a lot for having me. Um, so I, I thought I would talk about a project that involves electron microscopy as well as light microscopy data of um, Drosophila brains. Um, so as probably many of you know, there's been a huge effort at Genelia where I, was a fellow before I joined the MDC in Berlin to acquire um, large parts of a Drosophila brain. Um, so here you can see um, in the background, you can see um, just a micro CT for context. And the green box is the volume that has been acquired by FIPSAM. It's known as the hemibrain. And here you can see a video. Um, it, it was a year long effort. Um, uh, brain chopped into thick slices and then imaged with FIPSAM orthogonally. Um, and I worked a little bit on the reconstruction part um, where the thick slices first have to be flattened and then they can be registered. Um, this is the multi, multi, multi author paper. And quite amazingly, by now there's um, reconstructions of about 30,000 neuron morphologies um, done on this EM volume. So the segmentation, the automated part of the segmentation was done by a group at Google and then a huge team of human annotators um, has curated the segmentation. So 30,000 neuron, neuronal morphologies um, are tagged as good quality by now. Okay, but um, I wanted to talk about EM and light. So from EM, um, as you probably know, you can get um, a connectome of, of the brain um, because you can see all the synaptic connections between the neurons. But then the connectome probably doesn't tell you all you want to know. Um, and this is where light microscopy comes in. In light microscopy, you can study, um, it at least it has the potential to allow you to study the function of the neurons you're interested in. And there's another huge um, data set that has been acquired at Genelia. And this is 40,000 images um, of fluorescently tagged um, Drosophila brains. It's a sparse staining, and you can see a few examples here as maximum intensity projections. So some of them contain only a handful of neurons, and if you're lucky, they have different colors. Some of them are more densely packed, and it's getting hard to distinguish neurons. So, um, Electron microscopy is good for connectivity. Light microscopy is good for function. Drosophila is particularly good for um, studying both because it's 
brain is stereotypical at the cell level. Um, so a neuron that you can find in EM, um, you would then uh, want to find in a transgenic line that exp expresses um, the fluorescent tag in this neuron. Um, and this is what we've been working at. So given a light microscopy acquisition of a Drosophila brain, and some neuron that you're interested in from electron microscopy. A question that biologists are asking is, is my neuronal morphology of interest contained um, in this light microscopy acquisition? So we developed a, an approach um, to, do, to, to detect um, neurons in light microscopy, and it has two parts. The first part of our approach is to segment these neurons. And it's a very uh, exotic and exciting instance segmentation problem that I'm gonna talk about in a second. And then given an instance segmentation of these neurons, um, we want to find a given target neuron morphology among the, the instance segmentation. Okay, how do we segment these neurons? We developed an approach called patch per pix, that is a generic instance segmentation method, and it caters to the specific properties of the neurons in, um, in this light microscopy data. That is, first of all, an individual neuron spans a large uh, part of, of the data, of, of the image. Um, so all the proposal-based methods that are out there won't be applicable. And the second um, unusual property is um, because it's light microscopy and Drosophila neurons are thin, you can actually, because of partial volume effects, have multiple neurons occupy the same pixels. So you can get actual overlap in the pixel image. And there wasn't really a proposal-free method out there that could handle um, overlapping objects. And that's why we developed patch per pix. And first step towards our development was, was okay, maybe we're not gonna start on 3D data for which there's no baseline and it's not benchmark data. What we did in, oh, uh, sorry, I forgot this. Um, so where do we wanna end up? So this is a sparser um, acquisition and I just wanted to show you a ground truth segmentation before I start explaining the method. So here um, we have a region to the uh, left um, where we have actual overlap because of partial volume effects. Okay, so first thing we did um, towards method development was to switch to an easier case, um, 2D data. Uh, what you can see here, it's C. elegans in a dish. Um, it's from the broad bioimage benchmark collection by Carolina Verbitz, this data set. Um, and these swarms in a dish share the two um, important properties, namely that their bounding boxes are not great descriptors of the objects themselves, and they can overlap because it's 2D image data and the worms can crawl on top of each other. So we thought, how do we handle this overlap? And this is how we did it. Um, so first, we use a backbone neural network, um, and at each pixel of the image, what we predict is a tiny little um, square that you can see here. And what you can see within the square is um, a probability map of a, um, pixels in a, in a um, window around the center pixel. Um, probability map that these pixels belong to the instance at the central point. So you can interpret all these little squares as pieces of the shape of the instance at that pixel. And because these pieces of shape um, extrapolate around the pixel where they are predicted, they allow us to bridge at least a little bit um, overlapping regions. Okay, um, so how do we um, process these predictions to come up with the segmentation. You can see a few of the squares are marked in red. And, and um, these are predictions that we identify as good predictions. 
And we do this by leveraging the um, huge amount of redundancy that we have in these predictions. Um, you'll see that neighboring predictions are very similar. Ideally, they're the same uh, piece of the instance shape, just um, shifted by one pixel. And we leverage these redundancies um, to identify predictions that agree very well with the consensus. So we derive a consensus among all predictions for all pairs of pixels, whether they belong to the same instance or not. And then we can rank each individual prediction by means of how well it agrees with the consensus. And what do we need to come up with the segmentation? We just need some predictions to cover all foreground. And the red squares are good predictions that cover all of the foreground. And then we proceed with only them. So then all that is left to be done is to identify which of these predictions belong to the same instance versus different instances. And this is the next step. So we establish a graph on top of these good predictions. And the graph has weighted edges. So the weight for an edge is established just like um, before by looking at the consensus. So now we look at two predictions at once. We merge their foreground regions and we determine how well this merged little piece of a shape agrees with the consensus. And the red edges here um, mean positive agreement and the cyan edges mean negative. Um, this is just how we, uh, it's basically our consensus is just counting positive and negative examples. And um, all we then need to do is some sort of um, clustering in this graph. So easiest could even be just um, to extract the positive subgraph and cut through all the negative edges. But um, we also used other graph partitioning algorithms in other applications. And this is an exemplary um, segmentation that we get here. Okay, now we have our method that can bridge um, at least to some extent overlapping instances. And in terms of accuracy, so on this um, warm benchmark, it worked very well. So it worked quite a bit better than um, other methods that have been published on, on this data. But nobody had really um, leveraged both um, a neural network backbone and bridging overlapping regions. So nice, but not such a big surprise. Um, what was a bit of a surprise and we were very happy about is we also tried the method for um, segmenting neurons in electron microscopy. And on this 2012 ISB-EM segmentation challenge, it turned out to be the state of the art. Okay, how about our... Um, uh, light microscopy of Drosophila neurons for which we developed this. Um, so this is the example where we have grown truth again. And here I'm showing the patch per pick segmentation result. And you can see, okay, it's not perfect, but it gives large um, fragments of neurons that um, do look uh, usable in, the, in, in, a, in a way. Here's another example, which is a bit more dense. And this is how the patch per pix segmentation looks here. So it looks uh, messy. It has many smallish fragments. So far from perfect. Um, but now our second step comes in. So we want to find a target neuron morphology that you might have identified in your EM. Is it contained in this pile of segments or not? So for this, we developed a combinatorial optimization approach. So we phrased the problem as a combinatorial optimization problem where for each segment or rather frag fragment of the segmentation, um, we want to, we, we represent it as a um, binary variable where zero means um, it's not part of the target and one means it's part of the target. And we want to find the subset of segments that best explains the target morphology. And it has to be very fast because we want to do this on a ton of data. Um, so we developed a very fast um, 
custom solver for this problem. Um, and the approach is called Patch Per Pix Match. The paper is on BioArchive since July. And here you can see a result in this case. So these are the fragments that together best explain this target morphology. And um, now we can use these fragments to mask out the neuron in the actual light microscopy. And now I, I'm going to switch back to the uh, maximum intensity projection. And maybe if I switch back and forth, if you put the finger at the right position, you can see it in here. But yeah, at first glance, probably not. OK, and the Drosophila brain, I'm just always amazed to look at the stereotypicity. Now, if you put the target neuron morphology in um, the reference coordinate frame that, of course, we're leveraging in this approach. All right, I said it's it's got to be fast because there's 30,000 high quality neuromorphologies from EM and there's 40,000 of these light microscopy acquisitions and we wanted to search for each EM morphology in all of the light microscopy acquisitions which first of all means we need to do 40,000 3D image segmentations with patch per pix. And second, we need to do 40K by 30K searches, which is 1.2 billion. So our solver um, is yeah, fast enough to do it on a decent cluster in a few days. And we ran all of these searches and you can actually download the results if you're interested. Um, we were providing um, two kinds of visualization for our results. First is a PDF version where, where you can browse through the best hits. And second um, is a web page um, hosted at Genelia where you can search for your EM neuron morphology. You can also browse the Hemibrain. This is a, another site um, maintained at Genelia. And then if you like a neuron, you can find the light microscopy acquisitions that contain it. There's an alternative um, web-based tool where you can also look at our results. This is the Neuron Bridge tool that also hosts um, a, an alternative method developed by Hideo at, at Genelia. So you can browse our results and Hideo's results on Neuron Bridge. Okay, and um, that's it. Um, I want to thank everybody in the group, in particular Lisa, whose PhD project um, this is and people from the Flylight project team at Genelia who were instrumental to us being able to do this. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, Dagmar. Really nice talk. Um, let's just wait a bit until some questions come. Maybe I can just ask a very general question of, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, the, that the Drosophila brain is so stereotypical that really, you know, allow you to do this work. Um, like, can you apply this method to like other tissue, other cell types um, or, or other like organisms? Um. Yeah, so there's a few more organisms out there um, that have this level of stereotypicity. Um, so one of them that we're also working on is C. elegans, who has it for the whole body and not just the brain. And then there's Ascidians and the Platinaris that Anna mentioned. Um, I, I actually don't know if it's everywhere in, in Platinaris, or, but but I guess so. Um, hey, for the yeah, neurons, so like in the very 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 precisely, we are not so sure, but it's it's very stereotypic. Yes, like all the other cells are just yeah, they are where you would think they are. <laughs> Sorry, just uh, yeah. <laughs> So maybe it's just we move on, and then if there's any more questions um, to you, we can um, address them at the end. Um, so our um, final speaker um, today is Jan Funke, who is a group leader at the HHMI Genelia Research Campus, where his lab develops methods and tools for the automatic analysis of microscopy image data sets that are too large for manual inspection alone. And today he'll talk about prediction of functional properties for EM volumes of neural tissue. So um, Jan, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, um, and thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so um, we, we already heard a little bit about um, connectomics from Dagmar. So in this talk, um, we're going to explore a little bit more like how we can push 
in some sense, the limits of what we can get out of these data sets, right? And so just um, to provide a little bit of a small overview of what this topic is, uh, what this talk is going to be about. So we're going to specifically look at um, the prediction of um, functional properties from synopsis that have been acquired with electron microscopy data. And uh, so, so this is this is in itself already a very interesting topic. Um, but for us computational people, a much more interesting follow-up question to that is actually, if it works, how does it work? And how can we actually go backwards from there, right? So if we, if we know that uh, some of the functional properties can be predicted, what is it really that gives it away? Um, before we dive into that, um, I just wanted to give like a broad overview, like for context where this talk is uh, situated. So, so we're working on, um, on connectomics. So, so, so at least large parts of what we are working on in the labs um, are related to connectomics. And here's just like a cartoon um, image of what that field um, looks like. So you would start um, with a data acquisition where you take a brain, um, you slice it up into very thin sections, you do electron microscopy images on it. Um, afterwards, you have automatic um, segmentation methods like the ones that Anna and Dagmar have already been talked about. Uh, talked about in order to identify individual neurons, but also synapses, right, that are connecting these neurons with each other. This, of course, is never perfect. So there will be um, another step that is the manual correction, or we call it also proofreading, where literally like dozens of people spend <laughs> um, sometimes years in order to get um, to a final production quality um, connectome, which you then can use to make beautiful analysis and uh, and write your your paper in a journal of your choice. Um, just, we have already seen some connectomics data in uh, Dagmar's talk. Um, Dagmar has shown us the Haney brain, which is a very recent data set that has been acquired here in Genelia. This one here is a much older data set, but it's still very remarkable and it will also be the topic of this talk. And it's remarkable in the sense that it is to date the only complete brain imaged um, of a Drosophila. Um, uh, so what we see here is um, a zoom in into this brain and so just so that you can appreciate the amount of detail that we can see in these, these kinds of data sets. So we can really zoom in from the whole brain down to individual synapses like the one that you see right here where we can clearly see the cleft, we see postsynaptic patterns, we can identify individual vesicles uh, and so on. So this is still um, so far the only complete data set and um, it's still actively being used by the community to trace out neurons, mostly manually, now also with the help of automatic segmentation. And this is also the data set that we are going to talk about. Now, um, now that we have a little bit of an understanding what connectomics is and why we do it, right, um, um, we can talk about one of the main criticisms of connectomics, right? So what we can get um, at the end out of uh, at the end of the day out of these data sets are wiring diagrams, right? We know exactly how many neurons there are and how they are connected with each other. But one of the the most common criticisms is that we don't know much more about it, right? In particular, we don't know whether synapses between neurons are excitatory or inhibitory. And we don't know what kind of neurotransmitter is locally being released. And we don't even really know what the weight of the synapse is. Of course, we can look at the size of the synapse and can try to guess from that. Um, but there is no clear evidence that this is the only contributing factor to the weight of a synapse. And so this has pretty much been the state of the field um, until um, at some point um, I was running into Alexander Bates and Philip Schlegel um, after a connectomics conference. And we were wondering, is it actually true? Like, can we, is it really true that from these electron microscopy images we cannot see um, functional properties like the neurotransmitter type, for instance. And um, to test this hypothesis, now comes the stereotypy uh, into play again that has already been mentioned um, both by Anna and by Dagmar. Um, if you remember from, from Dagmar's talk, um, the Drosophila brain is extremely stereotypical. So that means if we have found a particular neuron, say to be gaba urchic in light microscopy, we can then try to match this exact same neuron in the electron microscopy data that we already have given that someone already went in and traced out this neuron to completion, including the annotation of the synapses. And so we can do that um, for a bunch of different neurotransmitters that have already been studied in the literature. So here we only show GABA, acetylcholine, and uh, glutamate, but there's a bunch more of those. And if we just simply take all of what we know about these neurons together and match that to the electron microscopy data that we already have, we can basically assemble a huge training data set um, where we do know precisely where the synapses are of specific neurons in the electron microscopy data set, in addition to what kind of neurotransmitter they are expressing. So this is great. Um, and uh, now from there on, it's fairly easy uh, to train a neural network um, on these synapse images directly and try to see, can they predict what kind of neurotransmitter is being released at this particular synapse? And so this is exactly what we did. And uh, the results really surprised us. Um, they surprised us because they were much, much better than chance um, than what one would expect, right? So what we see here is um, the confusion matrix for the prediction on a testing data set um, for six different neurotransmitter types. So we have GABA, acetylcholine, we have glutamate, 
serotonin, octopamine, and dopamine. And as you can see, a classifier trained on, on these, these data sets that we just got from the literature um, at times has accuracies above 90%, and it's sometimes a little less than that, um, more in the regime of 70 um, something percent, um, which is much, much better than chance. And so why are we surprised about that? I mean, of course, we know that neural networks are very good functional, uh, general function approximators, and they can do a lot of things effortlessly. Um, we are still surprised because humans cannot do the same. And it's not for lack of trying. These kind of data sets have been around since decades, and neuroscientists would have been happy, you know, if they could just look at the synapse and be like, oh, clearly this one is expressing acetylcholine, right? Um, but this doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, however, these networks just pick it up. And now I should also mention that this is just the performance on a single synapse, right? If you do make the assumption that a neuron, a single neuron, is only transmitting one particular kind of neurotransmitter, then of course we can aggregate all these. Um, uh, these predictions for a single for a single neuron over all its individual synapses, and then we can end up with numbers that are even a little bit more um, precise, and in some cases even too good to be true. Um, so here, for instance, in the case of octopamine, we should not read this as you know we never make a mistake. Um, keep in mind that um, the data that we test on here is a single neuron that happens to have a few hundred synapses, and we just happen to get this one correct. But it doesn't mean that, of course, that there's 100% accuracy. The bottom line, however, is that this surprisingly works, right? And so this is already great and, uh, and, and nice in, and of itself, and is a great help for the community because now we can take this network and we can apply it to previously unknown neurons or neurons for which we did not know the neurotransmitter type before. And this is currently happening. This is happening on this data set the, um, uh, that I showed in the beginning. It's also happening on the Hemi brain and on some uh, other newer data sets that we're currently acquiring. However, uh, oh, first of all, I wanted to show like what this could look like. So here we see a neuron and electron microscopy where each synapse has been color coded according to the prediction. And here we can see, for instance, if you look at this one, while well, that clearly seems to be um, cholinergic according to the classifier that we have trained, whereas other neurons like this one here, for instance, um, clearly seem to be GABAergic. So now this is this is great um, and and as I said, uh, quite surprising. But for us as computer scientists, actually um, also a little bit worrying, I have to say because we don't really understand why it works, right? And now there could be a bunch of reasons why this is working. And um, we really want to know what those are for at least two reasons. So one of them is we want to make sure that we're not just picking up on a confounder, right? Because maybe the network is not even predicting the neurotransmitter type, but just like the brain region. And we just happen to have all the GABAergic neurons in a different brain region than all the glutamatergic ones, right? So this could totally be the case. And another reason um, for trying to understand that better is maybe there's something to learn here. Maybe there are differences that we just haven't seen yet. And so this led us down um, quite a deep um, rabbit hole um, of interpretability methods and trying to understand the network itself that is making those predictions. Um, in the interest of time, I will not be able to go into too much detail here, but I want to give you at least a bit of a glimpse like what the strategy is. So now that we know that there are visual differences, um, that there are structural differences, that correlate strongly with um, uh, functional properties of these synapses. So we went basically back to look at these images again and see, is there something that we can spot? A short answer is no. We just looked at these images and there's no obvious difference that sticks out, right? And so we were wondering, maybe the reason why it's so hard to look at these images is actually because these images are not really comparable against each other, right? So we have this set of unpaired images and it's very hard to spot differences. And so we took inspiration from uh, a technology that is called, um, or a method that is called a cycle gun. And you might have heard about that if you have seen deep fakes, for instance, or style transfer networks. So they use, they use pretty much exactly that, um, that method. And what they learn to do is basically match the distribution of two different collections of images such that you can translate one image into the other. And crucially for us, what those methods are doing is they retain distractors in the images and only change the things that are relevant to change the class between these two images. Like here in this example, the number of legs that you see is the same, the number of trees in the background is the same, but the thing that is important to discriminate between a zebra and a horse, which is the texture of the fur, that is actually changing. And so we really just used this method and applied it to microscopy images of um, synapses, electron microscopy images, and we translated a real GABAergic synapse into one that um, is classified as octopamine. And now if you look at that, we can actually start to see differences because now we know that the difference that we see here between the left and the right image, they must be class relevant, right? And um, this is also in agreement with what the classifier says, the classifier that we trained earlier and has not been involved in the training of the cycle gun at all. Um, it would have a pretty high score for GABA on the real GABA image after translation and, uh, into the fake octopaminergic synapse, 
it is pretty convinced that this is octopamine now. And now we can even go one step further and we can ask, okay, which part of the image changed the classifier's opinion the most? And so this is a method that we have developed together with Niels Eckstein, the um, back then PhD student that was working on this project. You can find the um, preprint um, in the link below. And long story short, this is a method that tries to find the area of the image that if we were to swap it between the fake and the real image would again change the opinion of the classifier the other way around. Right? So if we take this area here and we swap it and now copy the real GABA image back into the fake octopamine image, then this is just enough to tell the classifier, yes, this is GABA again. Right? And so this is basically putting a spotlight on these paired images now. Right? So to recap, we started with um, a loose collection of images of these synapses. Now with the cycle gun, we can pair them and can see, okay, what are the class relevant changes? And now with this extra method here on top, we can even narrow it down a little bit and put a spotlight on the area that is arguably the most important in order to highlight those features. So equipped with this tool now, what we could do, and um, this is really something that Niels and me did, so both I should say that we are both computer scientists, we're not neuroscientists by training. We don't even have the words to describe all the things that we see in these images. Nevertheless, we could sit down for a few um, uh, afternoons, spend a couple of hours, just going through hundreds of these images and these, these, these spotlights, and we could peel out a bunch of hypotheses about what is going on here. What is the difference between GABA and octopamine, for instance? Which, to be fair, is pretty easy in the case of GABA-octopamine. You can probably already see that. But there are other cases like GABA and acetylcholine where the differences are much, much more subtle, and it's much harder to find that out. But again, by putting a spotlight on uh, where is the most class relevant change here between these two images, we were actually able to come up with a bunch of hypotheses. So here in this case, for instance, we could see after a while that if we go from GABA to acetylcholine, the synaptic cleft is consistently getting brighter in acetylcholine than it was in GABA. And the same also holds the other way around. If we just swip, swap the direction of the translation, start with real GABA, uh, sorry, with real acetylcholine and translate that into fake GABA, the cleft gets darker. So we did that, not just for those neurotransmitters that I just mentioned, but really for all of them, it took us a couple of hours. And at the end of the day, we had this long list of um, features um, that we that we peeled out of these this, this analysis um, uh, that not that don't exactly tell us like what is characteristic about one neurotransmitter type, but rather tells us what's the difference between two different um, neurotransmitter types, right? And uh, this is this is this is quite remarkable, I think, um, because so far we just didn't have the tools to make um, these these difference visible, right? So as I mentioned already, between GABA and acetylcholine, we found, for instance, that the that the cleft got brighter. Um, uh, between GABA and glutamate, we see that the vesicle sizes are starting to differ, and so on and so on. Now, there's one thing that is worth highlighting here um, before I um, get to the the um, to the end of my talk, and that is. We should also be very skeptical of what we have found here, right? And so that's also the reason why we call the thing that we see here a hypothesis matrix and not knowledge, right? The problem is we started with a network that we don't understand, right? We have a network that looks at these synapses and makes predictions about the neurotransmitter type, and we do not really understand what is going on on the inside. And in order to figure out what is going on, we are now um, using a cycle gun, which is another method that we don't really understand because it has you know, even larger networks and uh, even more um, parameters to create these paired images. And on top of that, we put another method that narrows down the search space for us and trying to, to point us at the class relevant features, right? So that also means that at the end of the day, we shouldn't just take those um, features that we see here at face value. Right. There's no reason to believe that the network would not hallucinate certain features, for instance, especially the cycle gun. It could have just made up something, some structures. And we're really talking about very subtle features here. For instance, the size change in the vesicles was really in a subpixel accuracy. We could barely see it, but once we saw it, um, it was very consistent. It could totally be the case that the cycle gun was just making these kind of things up, of course. So therefore, we should only consider those things that we find here uh, hypotheses, but not facts so far. Going from these hypotheses to the facts, however, so this is not too hard once you know what you're looking for. And so this is actually what we did. Um, the data is not shown here, but I can just um, briefly summarize that um, for the classical neurotransmitters, GABA, acetylcholine, and glutamate, um, we actually had um, people annotate a few hundred of those synopses by hand, where we asked them to paint every single vesicle, every single cleft, um, every single piece of membrane that was visible, count the number of postsynaptic partners, annotate the postsynaptic densities, and also label the T-bars and all of that on, on a few hundred um, 
instances per class. And um, equipped with this data, we could then really run an analysis and try to see, well, is it actually true that glutamate um, has larger vesicles than GABA, for instance? And uh, long story short, the answer is yes for everything that we have found so far. Um, we have found um, very significant differences in exactly those features. And, and that makes an, an, an our book really for, for a nice story because um, these are features that are so subtle that they really escape our human attention. And uh, these machine learning methods now that we are having, they can um, show us these features. They can visualize that. And they cannot really explain what is going on, but at least they can draw our attention towards um, certain structural features and uh, how they might correlate to functional properties of those, of those synapses. In this case, synapses, but um, of course, you know, point of this talk is also, you know, to um, inspire you and think um, if that works here on this domain, maybe you also have a data set where um, there is something surprising happening, where you are able to decode certain properties, um, like the cell type classification that Anna was talking about, for instance, um, where uh, we don't really understand what is going on under the hood, right? And where understanding that might both increase the trust in the method that we're using, but also might lead to new insights, like it was the case here, um, and open up the path for new questions, because now, of course, we, we are really interested in the question, why is it that glutamate has larger vesicles? Is this something that is required for glutamate? Does it somehow change the, uh, the physics, the biophysics of what is going on at the synapse and so on? All right, with that, um, I'm already at the end of this um, short contribution. I would like to thank, of course, everyone who was involved in this project, um, primarily Niels Eckstein, who was the PhD student working on this, and uh, our collaborators um, over in Cambridge, Alexander Bates, uh, Greg Jefferish, uh, Greg Jefferis, um, special shout out also to Michelle Du, who um, uh, was actually the one who um, started this project when she was here, and um, uh, she did it as a high school intern in, in our lab. So this really just goes to show that you know sometimes a crazy idea just needs you know to get started, and uh, doesn't really matter where in your career path you currently are. All right, uh, with that, I'm at the end. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Jan. That, that was an amazing talk. Um, I'm going to again um, ask Eric um, to come on stage to ask his question. But afterwards, I'd also just be really interested to hear of, you know, how, how these discussions go with neuroscientists. I mean, um, if you can give a, give a bit of backstory about that. But um, yeah, um, Eric, um, if you can ask your question. Um, hi, Jan. Thank you for this amazing talk. Hi, Eric. Um, very interesting. Um, how does your spotlight method compare to Sharp, which is basically as far as I understand, I'm not really deep into the topic, also a method to explain features and images with, which result in certain um, classification results. Yeah, so so we, did you mention SHA? Uh, SHARP. So I, I, I'm not familiar with this method. Um, so what we, or this, this author, um, what we what we did do, of course, in the beginning is we, we looked at the, um, uh, you, you're totally right, there's a lot of work already um, out there in terms of explainable AI and creating attribution maps, you know, for class relevant features. So we did look into that, but uh, none of those methods um, uh, showed, showed up anything um, that we could immediately make sense out of. Um, so as I'm not showing this data here in the interest of time, so there's a longer version of this talk where we go into those details as well. Um, but let me just say um, that classical methods that have been mainly developed on natural images don't seem to really be able to get the essence of what is class relevant. And I think one of the problems there is precisely because they are being um, developed on natural images where we already know what the class relevant features are, right? So if I give you an attribution map, you know, that shows on a cat image what the classifier thinks is important, then there is very little to question because almost anywhere the classifier would point you would think, yes, sure, that makes sense, right? If it's the ears, then you think like, oh yeah, sure, cats have pointy ears, right? And if it's the eyes, then you would be like, oh yeah, of course, um, cats have you know different eyes than say dogs, for instance. Um, this 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 was prominently actually discovered by a method that is called guided grad cam. Um, you might have heard about that one, um, which was later shown to actually be completely independent of the network weights that you have learned. So no matter what you what kind of network, um, no matter what kind of training data you used, the network, this method would always tell you the exact same attribution map you know, uh, for, for a given input image and just basically be an edge detector. But it was um, perceptive, it, it, it led people to think that this is an actual attribution map um, because edges, well, you know, they are important in images. And when humans look at it, they, they do make sense of it. 
Now, our situation was very different because we didn't know what we were looking for. We just don't know yet what is the difference between these um, classifiers. And so we came to the realization that these um, single image attribution methods uh, are not suitable in our task. And instead, we started asking, um, uh, maybe there is no single way to, to, um, um, to point in an image to what is relevant here. But maybe we should rephrase the question in terms of what's the difference between two classes. And the moment we started thinking about that and explain what is going on in terms of differences of classes, um, things started to show up. Okay. Thank you. So Dagmar also had a question. If Dagmar, if you can um, come on stage and um, turn on your camera and mic. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hi, Dagmar. Hey, Jan. Yeah. So this is super exciting. And I, I was wondering, um, so people really didn't know that vesicles are bigger in one neurotransmitter versus the other. So again, computer scientists speaking here, but I'd be thinking, isn't it possible to look at these synapses in cryo ET and then mm. maybe see the differences more clearly? Do you know? Yes, if, if yes, absolutely, it? yes. I, I think the, the, the problem is um, you wouldn't do it if you don't know that it makes sense. And I should also um, refine the statement. Um, yes, we do know that there are differences in vesicle sizes. What we did not know is that there is one between GABA and glutamate. So broadly, you can um, divide neurotransmitters into classical and non-classical neurotransmitters, right? The GABA glutamate are both classical ones. And the non-classical ones are, for instance, of dopamine, right? And as we have already seen in the very first images that we translated, um, Octopamine has clearly much larger vesicles, and this has been known, right? So you would look at that and you would think, oh, this is a so-called uh, a dense core vesicle, right? Versus these little guys here are clear core vesicles. And people would immediately know, okay, so this one cannot be GABA. It's not one of the classical ones. It's one of the um, non-classical neurotransmitters. Um, so that people have known, but then the subcategorization into what exactly it is, that has been unknown so far. Thanks. There's also a question from Valentina. I'll also um, bring her to stage. Oh, hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Hi, Valentina. Uh, hi, uh, sorry, I completely forgot all the names, so it would be really great. Yeah, if you go back to this slide, I think. Uh, yeah, this sertraline is. Yes. I ah, know the oct is constantly confused with sertraline, uh... but never really. Yeah. The other way around. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, that is a very good observation. Wow, wonderful that you saw and, that. And 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 actually, the same applies to glutamate, I guess. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Totally. Um, exactly. Glutamate, for instance, gets more likely confused with serotonin, but serotonin not really with glutamate, yes. And I think this makes sense, right? So, so say you have um, uh, two classes that are very hard to distinguish from each other, right? And the classifier has like a 50-50 chance to getting it right, right? So then, then, then these solutions are equally good, right? So you could just always say glutamate and you, you, you're done, right? Um, so, so in other words, there's no incentive um, for the classifier to be symmetric in the mistakes that it makes, right? And that's that's kind of even even a good thing for us. So so not shown here, but on the uh, Hemi brain data that also Dagmar was talking about, we see, for instance, a very strong confusion between glutamate and GABA, right? So there, um, this one would be like um, in the order of fifteen percent or so. So like fifteen percent of all the glutamatergic synapses would be mistaken as GABA, but not the other way around, right? And um, and again, this is this this asymmetry in the prediction. Um, so this makes perfect sense for the classifier to do that if there is ambiguity. Right, it doesn't need to confound two of them. It can. It's 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 okay if it confounds one of them. And uh, actually, seeing that made us kind of happy um, because the GABA and glutamate are metabolically linked to each other. They're basically one added step away from each other. Uh, so you would kind of also expect that their phenotype is very similar. And in fact, this is this is this is something that we see consistently. It's, we see it also in a new data set now, um, a VNC data set of the of Drosophila, where we have the exact same confusion pattern. Of course, it would be better if both of them be predicted perfectly. But if we have to confuse two of them, then this is the one that makes sense. OK, that's cool. I was wondering whether you tried to check like the pre-classification layer features. 
like uh, to yeah to no we did not do that Why, what would you do with that i mean there you could like see the decision boundary and all the stuff and maybe you could see like general groups yes that yeah. some of the yeah some of the transmitters should be really close together and some would be really distinct yeah like yeah no, that, that would be a very interesting post analysis yeah now that's that's a good point actually yeah yeah we might learn a bit no, more about um you know exactly because you now as, as you pointed out right this this asymmetry can really only be explained if there's like two types of GABAergic synapses one that is clearly GABAergic and the other one that looks similar to glutamate, right? And then the question is really how, how does the classify it, like how does it deal with this confusing class, right? And here I guess the answer is that it just goes for one of the two answers and that leads to this asymmetric um, confusion that we are seeing here. Yeah, uh, that would be interesting to, to shed more light onto, onto these decision boundaries, yes, and see like what different kinds of classes there are, yeah. That's very true. Okay, sounds great, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Um, so Eric still had a question um, to Dagmar. I, I forgot um, to answer that, but if, um, Eric, you can um, ask. So this is the, the previous talk. I, I, um, since you since you tested this on worms, uh, and uh, in my lab we also work with animal tracking. Is uh, patch to pigs? Do you consider it feasible to do it for animal tracking as well? Because, for example, if you have two fish swimming on top of each other, uh, to distinguish those, that's, that's a very similar problem to your, the worm static image, but in 3D because you have 2D plus time. And um, do you think it's feasible to apply your method on animal tracking, or do you think it's out of scope and probably won't work ever? So 2D plus time would be doable. So we're, we are doing, we are running patch per pix on 3D data. So all the Drosophila light microscopy data is 3D and I've been showing maximum intensity projections. Um, and there we can have, we can predict patch sizes up to I think 15 cube. Um, and this, these are sufficiently large pieces that you can bridge some overlap. Um, so 2D plus time, I, I'd say worth a shot. 3D plus time, so if you have a 3D tracking problem, um, the patch size would be, I guess, um, too small to, um, to bridge any mm, meaningful uh, overlap. Um, and to this end, we're working on um, scaling it up. Yeah, but um, tracking 2D plus time, should be possible. So I um, want to check it out. Follow, um, yeah, one follow up question. Do you think it would be a problem if they, the objects do not overlap in time? So basically, if you have jumps between the objects? Uh, I, I don't know, that's probably an out of scope question. Hmm. In theory, I'd say it should be able to learn the jumps. But I guess that's more than an engineering question to see if it actually does that. So I haven't tried on, on such data, so I cannot tell for sure. But I'd say it would be interesting to try. OK, I think we'll now wrap up. So again, like thanks to all three speakers for really, really um, exciting talks. And now, um, There'll be a chance to meet the speakers if, if you go into the lobby after the event. So you'll be seated at tables and you just have to click on the table you want to visit. And everyone else who wants to leave, um, please just um, close your browser um, so that you don't just hang around uh, like a ghost in, in the room. <laughs> so yeah, thanks everyone and see you in the um, lobby. <laughs>